I'm curious what people thought about the split format last uh, on Tuesday. Was that helpful? I think it helped answer some questions, so I found it helpful. Nice. Well, we're, I'm willing to constantly try to improve. So just uh, keep letting us know what's working, what's not. You said, we're, yeah, we are live, right? AJ, all right. So we are live. welcome back, everybody. So um, we talked, the video this time was about trajectory optimization. The lecture this time was about trajectory optimization. And um, as I said in the lecture, I feel like there's a few big ideas and then loads of details. So uh, let me put up the, you know, the recap on the, that I, I had written on the board in the lecture and make sure that the big ideas landed and maybe just leave a little space in the beginning to, to if you guys wanna ask any questions about any of the details, we can go into them. Uh, and I think I, you know, I've continued to tune up the notes um, this morning and everything. I, I hope they're in pretty good shape for, for all of these details. Okay, so the biggest idea of all, I think, is that uh, we're trying to give up on trying to solve for all X. That's a very, very hard thing to do in high dimensional complicated systems. And we can make the problem fundamentally easier by thinking about a single initial condition. Because now taking, if we're thinking about a solution over time as a trajectory of a single initial condition, basically, even if I need to discretize that, which we often do for our numerical methods, I only need to discretize it a long time. We're putting a mesh on a state space where the size of the state space gets bigger. I get so, like, I, in the trivial ways, I get an exponential increase in the, the size of my discretization. And that, that's what kills us. If I have just a trajectory in time, then as my state gets bigger, I, I will get probably linearly big more parameters, but not exponentially more parameters. So it's a fundamental approach to um, scaling to much bigger systems, more complicated systems potentially in that sense. And I now remember having watched the video that I made some bad joke about doing yoga, uh, but I, I think that's something actually uh, really true. I think, uh, and I, RL talks about it, reinforcement learning talks about it in terms of having on policy distributions and having to focus your, your cost and your trials on the right distributions of rollouts. Uh, it's the same kind of thing is that I should focus my optimization efforts on the part of the state space that I visit. I should, the ones I visit most often should be the most important. And thinking about distributions of solutions is sort of ultimately a very good thing to do. This is the extreme case where I've reduced that to a single point as my initial as my distribution of initial conditions. Um, but as we'll see, and I'll talk more about it in the next lecture, we talk about stabilization. If you can run the trajectory optimization fast enough, which we often can, then it can become a feedback controller by, by just wherever I am right now, I'll solve a trajectory. Wherever I am right now, I'll solve a trajectory and then just repeat even at, at uh, a high frame rate. So that's the biggest idea is crack the exponential blow up of state space by changing to, to just a single trajectory. When I do that, my decision variables become, I, I tend to write this general form here with the, I'm minimizing over some trajectory parameterization. You uh, as a function of time where I've got some, um, I'll write the entire interval as a, with a dot in the middle of some running cost uh, just the way we've done always, right? It's almost exactly the same formulation, but just solved over a particular trajectory. And then I talked about, you know, direct transcription, shooting, co-location, only a little bit about pseudospectral, but I, I, I wrote up the notes uh, more carefully about that with pseudospectral, because I, I think a, a few people are seeing pseudospectral methods in the Aero Astro, Steve Hall teaches them in the Aero Astro um, class that's most similar to this. So uh, if you see that, I wanted to make those connections. Do people feel a general sense of, of where those things fit? Can I answer any questions?
Um, yeah, I can ask a question. So awesome. in the lecture, I don't recall you mentioning in detail about the Slack variables for the, um, yeah, for the direct transcription. Did I miss that or? Good. So, um, so, no, that's a great question. Thank you. So, so Slack variables are a general um, approach uh, to uh, there's there's some optimization uh, formulations that that if you add additional uh, decision variables, you can make a system either easier to write down or actually write something down in a way that's convex in the parameters that you couldn't write down in the original coordinates. So I did in the notes, I, I think it was under the direct transcription, give an example of just how powerful op the optimization language is. Um, for instance, absolute value looks like it should be, it doesn't look like it should be a linear objective, but actually it can be made into a linear objective with Slack variables. And that was a, just one call out to a, really a, a, a huge, uh, set of, of tricks that, that uh, optimization folks use to sort of write the very, write the optimization problems better. In convex optimization, it becomes, it's, there's a, a higher premium on, on knowing those tricks for convex optimization because sometimes it's the difference between being able to write it in a convex way and not. Um, in a lot of our trajectory optimization, we are gonna live with the nonlinear, non-convex um, solvers. So um, they will tend to, they can pr perform better if you, if you write your costs and constraints well, but they will uh, accept almost any form of the constraint. Was that uh, what you meant? Yeah, thanks. Cool. Okay, there are a bunch of solvers out there too. So I, I did, um, you know, I said in the notes that you that thinking about the convex uh, form, which really only works for linear systems, but it's just so, um, I think it's, it's such a good way to get your head around the problem that I, I do think it's, there's a lot of value in thinking that through. And what you can think about um, when you're thinking about the nonlinear solvers, in fact, in particular, when you're using SNOPT, which is the default solver that we use for nonlinear optimization, trajectory optimization uh, in Drake, it is a sequential quadratic programming. So really an algorithm, which means effectively what it is doing, it is taking all of your constraints that are nonlinear, non-convex constraints, making a local linear approximation of them. It's taking your quadratic function, which is maybe not convex, maybe not quadratic and it's making a local quadratic approximation and it's solving the convex optimization problem. And then after that solution, it updates and makes a new, uh, new approach. So it really is kind of doing in an iterative way, the, the convex uh, trajectory optimization. But these days there's a, you know, there's a cost to calling a solver like SNAP. Uh, I think a lot of people, the people who are, have made trajectory optimization really fast tend to roll their own and augmented Lagrangian seems to be a really popular uh, formulation today. So, so let me make sure I'll I may continue to take any questions you have, but let me make sure I, I say a couple things. So first of all, people really do use trajectory optimization. I think if you look in the autonomous driving world, many of you I think have uh, uh, increasingly, I, I find people have spent a summer at a, at a self-driving startup or something like this, uh, which is awesome. But if you look at um, you know, the technology and the state-of-the-art solving, not all of the, the uh, self-driving car companies do use trajectory optimization, but many actually do. And you will hear trajectory optimization come up in talks by the top places. Uh, it really is a natural formulation where if you're thinking about, for instance, uh, oops. I'm going to do it this way. So, if you're thinking about having an autonomous vehicle, I'll just make my little cartoon here. And you're 
want to do a lane change, right? This is a standard uh, example where you have some desired trajectory you'd, you'd like to write down, which is I'd be I'd like to be over here. I am currently in the other lane. And if you want to somehow compute a smooth path that takes into account the dynamics of the vehicle, oftentimes the dynamics of the vehicle in these cases are very simple, simple. So they'll use a simple dynamics model. Oftentimes the bicycle model comes up until you need higher performance um, uh, models. Bicycles turn, tend to be very, very easy. You might think, why wouldn't I try a model with four wheels? But actually it's a pain to, to think about Ackerman steering and the, and the, the complexity of, you know, when you are turning in a car with four wheels, you are actually exploiting friction and sliding in a kind of gross way. And it's just way easier to think about a bicycle and you get the effective dynamics um, pretty well with the bicycle model. So you have you know, your position and velocity of the frame of the bike, your angle of the, of the front wheel, you could have a steering torque and then a acceleration uh, input. Sometimes people will turn it into a first order system, but, but in the second order, in the standard form, it would be just a bicycle, as kind of a bicycle that can't fall down. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so, so if you have a desired trajectory, so a cost function, which is the, the distance from my desired trajectory in the other lane, Make sure my I just saw the chat. I will address that in a second. Um, distance from the trajectory. Then, you know, there's a natural question of how aggressively should I move over, right? And I and uh, there are extra costs that come in in terms of safety constraints, maybe you never want to drive backwards on the highway, right? Uh, comfort constraints tend to be a major focus uh, in autonomous driving that solutions that might be optimal from a dynamics and control perspective make people feel funky. And so they have to, you know, it's, it's really, you, you want to establish confidence in the, uh, in the vehicle. So these kind of things actually fit very nicely into sort of the cost function framework. And then you might have constraints Although, let me say something about this in a second here, right? Uh, for instance, don't collide with another vehicle, right? And that one you think definitely had better be a constraint, right? But the only, um, I think sometimes those constraints tend to be softened into costs just so you never have the solver return no solution. Uh, so you, you'd like to have guaranteed best effort from the solver. So a lot of times in this in, in this setting where you just want to make darn sure it always returns something, um, you give a, a cost for collision instead of a, uh, <clears throat> a hard constraint. That's more just a numeric thing than a, um, you know, you can you can make those as stiff as possible. Okay, now just consider so so you know it, it's not surprising that if you then put um, comfort constraints or acceleration constraints that our trajectory optimization toolkit will do something like solving for a nice trajectory that will sort of smoothly go across and that's a reasonable way to take into account all these constraints and do it uh, and do the maneuver but if you think about the contrast with what we've been doing so far um, you know, why don't we do sums of squares, you know, to make a big policy, right? This system isn't super high dimensional the way I've written it so far. And, and in the lecture, I felt like I emphasized the dimensionality as the major motivation for, for trajectory optimization. But there's another important one, which is uh, the ability to solve online versus offline, right? So in these formulations, if I, if I could do sums of squares online, that would be awesome, uh, but they tend to be slower. The trajectory optimization problems, even for modest size problems, 
tend to be simpler optimizations, faster optimizations. You can run them online. And if you don't know until runtime, the location of the other vehicles, even the location of the lanes, right? Those are all estimated from your perception system. Then you don't even know all the parameters that you wanna put in your costs and constraints until runtime. So when you get to this sort of online planning, um, is another you know, major motivation for, for uh, let's say a simpler optimization, a trajectory optimization versus others. I, it's not that, um, I mean, if you could do online feedback design, awesome. Uh, but, but just uh, you tend to, to resort to these simpler optimizations. And the other point I'll make, I will talk about the pseudo spectral in a second here, is that, um, you know, I said in the video last year, right, which was like, I don't know, uh, the last lecture before, uh, in fact, I don't know if you noticed, but I was like, the midterm will be, that midterm never happened, by the way. That was like, you know, on, on Wednesday, they told us, yes, you can have a midterm. On Thursday, I gave a lecture. On Thursday afternoon, they're like, yeah, you just go home, don't come back. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I had talked about, uh, you know, trajectory optimization, our trajectory optimization on Atlas. Uh, and how I was afraid to run it, right? And then Scott, in a few, you know, a few months later, was giving us some update on on what they're doing at Boston Dynamics. And so um, I forgot to mute this it. This is basically the architecture that we've been developing in order to do this. Um, and it basically broken up into two parts. Uh, first is an offline phase, and this is really where you might use the term behavior creation, and we're leveraging offline nonlinear trajectory optimization in order to create uh, sort of template behaviors uh, for the robot. And these, you know, can range, in, you know, in, in um, a variety of with the kind of things that you're seeing here. So, you know, jumping on and off ramps and doing spin jumps and flips and, and so on. Um, but then these form a sort of database of behaviors that are available to the robot online. And so it's really the job of the online planning control system to uh, look at the environment around the robot, uh, use information that's available uh, through the perception system to select from among the behaviors in its library. And then it has to use online model predictive control in order to adapt those behaviors to successfully execute them given the current situation of the robot's in. Okay, so I don't want you to watch the whole thing right now, although you should watch it at some point. It's an awesome talk uh, and he gave me even a more recent one at, uh, at the NeurIPS last, uh, last year. But they, they have, have taken this trajectory optimization all the way through to where they're, they're, most of those videos have a major uh, component of trajectory optimization inside them. Now to do the trajectory optimization that they're doing and that you will we, we will continue to talk about it in class and, and think about the more complicated cases where you're handling contact, making and breaking contact that you have to do for full-on trajectory optimization for those kind of maneuvers. Uh, but it's uh, it's just awesome that that they've taken that all the way to, to fruition. So it really does work. Uh, I guess the last thing that I had uh, queued up video-wise here was, it's also a great thing I mentioned in the lecture, but- In this um, project, I explored patterns of optimal dynamic soaring using trajectory optimization. Dynamic soaring is a flight maneuver to extract energy from wind shear. The difference in wind speed. This is a final shear. project. Wind from shear last is year. commonly caused by mountain ridges. It's a great wind topic for the mountain final project. Still air on the other side. Sometimes this causes a strong wind gradient that can be used for dynamic soaring. Wind shear is also present in large open areas such as the ocean, where winds closer to the surface area are slower than those at higher altitudes. This can be described with the logarithmic wind profile. Birds, such as the albatross, can make use of this wind gradient to travel thousands of kilometers without needing to flap their wings. Let's take a look at how dynamic soaring works by looking at an optimized trajectory for a two-dimensional model of an unpowered glider flying in a loop while gaining airspeed after one cycle of the loop. First, the glider pierces the layer of air in which a strong headwind is present. Since the glider keeps moving due to inertia, this results in an increase in its airspeed. Then, the glider performs a turn, aligning itself with the direction of the wind. This increases its ground speed while maintaining airspeed up to some inefficiency of the turn. 
Once the glider exits the layer of fast moving wind into still air, it once again gains airspeed. And after one more turn, it can start the next cycle, having gained speed. This trajectory was optimized with a direct transcription approach using Snopped via Drake. Giving a good guess for successful optimization of dynamic soaring trajectories is a bit tricky, but specifying a guess using a few waypoints worked well. Good. A very simple point mass aircraft model was used. Where all? Anyhow, okay. So, I mean, and you, I, I, I will post a few of the, the videos that uh, I've gotten permission to, to post, but that, that was an awesome one. And he, he goes on to then actually show different conditions and, and sort of almost use trajectory optimization as a tool to understand dynamic soaring better, uh, which, I, which I thought was really awesome. So this is one of the tools that, um, especially for doing one, uh, you know, if it doesn't have to be robust, but you want to show the system, understand the capabilities of a system, it's a great, uh, it's a great thing to, a great tool to play with. It can be frustrating to play with. Like uh, people who use it for their final project will go through this sort of valley of emotions where, <laughs> <laughs> where you know you've got your dynamic model and then you've written up your cost function and it doesn't work and it's and and then you know at the end you get these cool videos out but but it is uh, it is sort of a frustrating thing whereas um, the convex optimization right if you if you if it's not working you have a bug uh, and and you can find take steps to debug it and everything like this this one uh, it's not guaranteed to work. If you don't, if it's not working, there are things you can try to do, but debugging trajectory optimization in the nonlinear form is much more uh, complicated. Okay, in the, so Charles asked uh, probably about the Atlas. I'm sorry that I, I don't have my windows organized well enough to see these as they come in. Um, so yeah, the actual objective in the bottom videos, which is probably Scott's bottom videos for the model predictive control uh, we will talk about that some more, but uh, one of the things that has been a winning idea in terms of uh, trajectory optimization for walking robots in general, certainly humanoid level, is to use much simpler models. And uh, you use these, and Scott even has a video of like this um, enormous m, m with little hands and legs sticking out of it uh, coming off because he thinks of it as like basically uh, just an inertial mass uh, go, flying through and just happens to have little appendages that can produce forces. But, but it's, um, we, we use simplified models of, uh, of the humanoid that are really thinking of it more like a, um, just a, a mass that happens, that has a center of mass dynamics, it has angular momentum dynamics, but you relatively ignore the dynamics of the limbs. That's where, when you see quadrupeds like Spot uh, that have super light legs, that makes those assumptions uh, better. And that's why, why those things even work really well. And then um, what problem are you solving to get it to walk over the blocks? So that's, okay, that's a very hard question to answer, but uh, because, so, so let's see. What you would like to do is somehow say, I'm starting in my initial condition standing here. I want to be standing over there. There's some blocks in the way. Um, just just solve the problem, you know, solve the problem that is subject to all the non-penetration constraints and force constraints and get me over there and it will do like parkour to get there. And that's not quite where we're at yet. I think it is much more like we're going to give some waypoints that sort of give us characteristically what we want the system to do and the trajectory optimization will kind of fill in. I, I can't speak for the state of the, the, the newest state of, of the Atlas uh, trajectory optimizer, but in my experience, it tends to require um, a little bit of work from the, from the designer to impose costs and constraints that are pretty specific asking for what you want. Uh, so it's probably uh, what you would like to not do, and I believe they are not doing is to, to constrain the exact timing of every um, of every placement a contact with your with your body in the world that's very hard uh, so that's very fragile if you have to specify that but what you are probably doing is saying that there I'm in, I, you know around time five I'd like to be sort of you know in the air over the blocks and uh, you know have some some velocity that's greater than two and less than six and you know something like this and and you give more and more hints to the solver with that to kind of guide it to find the solution uh, that you want. I think 
I mean, this happens in machine learning too. And in, in uh, uh, Poolkit was talking about it just the other day. He was saying some, somehow that uh, the problem with machine learning is it'll do exactly what you ask it to do. <laughs> and it's really hard to ask it to do what you want it to do, right? Because uh, uh, it's just, there's so many interpretations for the cost that we tend to write down that it'll often find one that you didn't really want. But we, we will do walking examples in some detail in the next couple of lectures. I just want to, since I had said that we were afraid to do it uh, on, on Atlas, and then Scott immediately said, yeah, we're, we're totally doing it on Atlas. I wanted to write the wrong. OK, so uh, Franklin asked, uh, could you be a bit more detailed about Gauss libido points in the pseudospectral section? What are they, and what are they chosen to be the co-location points? So I can. That's, but that's, a, that's pretty new. So, so let me, I actually have. Um, Right, so let me think about the right way to answer that. And bring everybody along. I could also, um, if you were to post that, I could give a, a longer answer there, but let me say something that I think is uh, useful now. But, right, so the pseudo-spectral methods, I, I think for everybody to, to be on the same page are different the way that the main way that they are different from the uh, the collocation type methods that we talked about the transcription methods, where the the collocation method, for instance, made a piecewise polynomial approximation of the desired trajectory. In the pseudo spectral, you make a single polynomial of potentially very high degree that goes over the entire uh, time range that you want. Uh, and then you try to be very clever in your parameterization of those trajectories in order to make the numerics not terrible. Uh, and actually, they, they tend to work very, very well, I think, uh, and they're more amenable to analysis. The piecewise stuff is a complicated thing to analyze, and there's relatively less sort of uh, strong results in terms of convergence when you're close to a local minima and things like that, whereas the the orders and accuracies of the superspectral methods are much are much uh, richer. The analysis they do they do use collocation points. They enforce the constraints along particular collocation points. Um, they're chosen very carefully to match the order of these polynomials. I mean, this is uh, the polynomials are chosen to be orthogonal to get it to have the numerics play well. And the collocation points are chosen somehow optimally in using a fairly complicated, I mean, not it's well known, but a fairly complicated understanding of what polynomials do over the interval negative one to one, and then they scale that out. So um, that's where the answer is hiding. So uh, is, is why do those points work out to be magically good uh, in the end. That's what the, makes the, the Gauss uh, Rado points. Yeah, there's, it, it really is, um, people, know, people know a lot about what a polynomial of a certain degree can do over a fixed interval. It's the particular fixed interval of like negative one to one and, uh, and then they, they, they really stretch this out. Uh, I would have to think, even look up what makes those points optimal over that interval. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I have known at one time. Uh, but if you, do, if you do want more of a, quite, a better answer than that, I can certainly look it up. What else? What? How do people feel about trajectory optimization? I mean, even do, do you have a problem where you want to say, "Hey, could I do trajectory optimization for for X or or anything of that form?" Yeah. Why would I do trajectory I a, optimization versus some squares? Yeah, I had a more general question. Um, so, for trajectory optimization, for like the example with the car, we have it so that as a, we can use it as a controller to follow some desired trajectory. Like, how could we formulate optimization in general to form that trajectory in the first place, to form like the, the path 
that we'd want to follow. Um, yeah. Um, I, it, it really looks like these piecewise polynomials that we tend to, to, to write down. There's a few different parameterizations. I think uh, another common one, which I didn't include in the notes is our Bezier polynomials, Bezier splines, but they tend to be these, they, they, they must be sort of um, finitely parameterized curves. And there's only a handful that people really like, and they all have slightly different properties. So the, you know, the, the piecewise polynomials we used here have a nice property in the sense that we know the order of the integration accuracy when you put certain, um, you know, co-location points. The Bezier polynomials have the property that we know they will never leave the set of the of these control points. So there's so if you really want to make sure you don't go outside some critical region, you might prefer a Bezier polynomial. Uh, and there's different subtle reasons to use each one, but they're basically the the land of uh, parameterized curves over one over time. I see. So to that formulate to for for like our autonomous car to follow some path. Um, would we would a cost function to generate that path that it wants to follow? Would it be like some distance away from the sides of the road and distance away from objects that we see, something along those lines? And it would be able to find a path out of that. Right. So um, you you totally could. I think it tends to be more go to this particular center lane than to go uh, like there's a joke right where you can tell. Uh, I, I heard uh, I think Elon Musk say that that you can tell when a Tesla's on. When you drive behind a Tesla on autopilot, because it's dead center in the road, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and uh, uh, it turns to it tends to be easier and possibly more robust to give a, um, a specific answer than to give the whole range of answers and then try to match it. Because the thing you don't want to do, especially in an online optimization form, is to have many solutions be be perfectly you know satisfy your right. constraints. Yeah, because it could pick a different one at every time. You'd like it to have it re return consistent uh, optimized stations. But yes, otherwise what you said is true. Now, they also tend to be fairly short look aheads in time because mm -hmm. the hardest part of driving is predicting what the other agents are going to do, right? And as we get better from that, for that, you know, you you will you will will do better and better at sort of rolling forward the dynamics of the other agents. But if you think about it, your ability to plan into the future is limited a little bit by your planning, but not really. It's really limited by how accurate your model is and your models got other drivers in it. Are they gonna turn left at the lane? Are they gonna cut me off? You know, And so those are only good for relatively short windows into the future. I see. Uh, actually on that note, would it be, how difficult do you think it'd be to introduce some level of stochasticity to the cost, to the running cost as, okay. as you're solving, as you're running online? Yeah, yeah. So, so we we'll, we will talk about that. Oh. You can definitely do the stochastic trajectory optimization too. Sometimes that actually even makes it better. Uh, yeah. Some, some things that are that are like discontinuous in the deterministic case can be smoothed out with a little Gaussian, uh, you know. So, so that can often make it better, and it certainly fits in the framework. The the one line trick is that the expected value is the one that so the additive cost. Has this made it magical structure, right? Where we can we can iterate backwards with the Bellman recursion. If you do the expected value of, of a, a running additive cost, then because that's a linear operator, then you can do thing. You can keep all of your nice Bellman structure. So we're going to be able to do expected value stochastic control very nicely. And then there's other cases where you can do a bit. Um, the other case would be to do robust control, where you say you say the that the other agent might be anywhere in these, and I just definitely don't want to type, go into any of those regions. I see. Oh. Um, I have kind of an unrelated question if, if other people aren't gonna jump in on this, but um, I've heard about something called differential dynamic programming and it's related to trajectory optimization, but I just wanted to get a, like just contextualize where it is in relation to what we've learned so far. That's such a good, those are super good questions. So, so I thank you for that. I mean, that, is, that is a great thing to, I mean, I think because other people have heard about these things too and just helping to connect the dots. So I'm going to talk about it. Um, I think I talk about it in the next lecture. I haven't rewatched oh, okay. the next lecture, but the reason, that, the reason it goes in the next lecture is because, um, so, so just to forecast it, you can stabilize a trajectory with LQR, okay? If you were to think about doing trajectory optimization by, taking your nominal trajectory, stabilizing it with LQR, 
but where the cost is is a little bit off the the actual trajectory, then that actually gives you another trajectory optimization algorithm. So, so um, yeah, I, I just to think about if I can say it without right. So. Um, it's there, there's something called iterative LQR, which really is run LQR along your trajectory. But if, you're, if your goal is not to get to zero, which would be the nominal trajectory in the, in the coordinate system, but to get to minimize some cost, which is might be minimized off the trajectory, that LQR will locally make a change to your trajectory, the time varying version of LQR. If you run that iteratively, then it will be, it gives you a trajectory optimization, one that's very popular. People like it, iterative LQR. Okay. Differential dynamic programming is almost identical to iterative LQR. It, it just makes one difference where it does a second order, um, a, a second order approximation of the dynamics instead of the first order linear approximation of the dynamics. Uh, I think these days, iterative LQR is more popular than differential dynamic programming, but a lot of people say differential dynamic programming, and you read, read their paper, and they're actually doing iterative LQR. Okay. Huh. So uh, yeah, but the real differential dynamic programming was like, you know, Bellman did it way back and. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and just going back to maybe something early in the semester, I understood that LQR, you need to linearize the model about that point, about the operating region. So at some point along a trajectory, we, we linearize around that point. Um, am I misunderstanding? Because I thought LQR, you could only, or you could only linearize the system around some stable point. Good. That's I was, I was, it's not that you're doing a time invariant linearization around a, a, a point on the trajectory. Mm -hmm. You're going to do a time varying linearization. So you get A as a function of T times X plus B oh. as a function of T times U. And that you can do in a moving coordinate system along the trajectory. And it works. I see. And, it's and so would, would A of T stay consistent through that trajectory? No. Yeah, but you'd have to you'd have to relinearize at each point. Okay, yeah. okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you'll we'll see that uh, completely on Tuesday. That's a, a big part of Tuesday. Gotcha. Yeah, so DP a... is another popular, uh, definitely, definitely popular method. Well, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, I'm thinking of ways to. For example, to leverage offline computation for trajectory optimizations that are too long to to run online, and for example, so one idea could be to would it would it be possible to solve many trajectory optimizations from all kinds of initial conditions, and then extract a, a cost to go function from that, and then you you would be able to use HG, the HGB online. And find an optimal uh, input. I think it's a great idea. So th there are lots of ways that you can do offline computation to speed up. I think even simpler than what you said. If the, the first part of what you said solve a lot of them offline, and that and the, if you noticed, Scott used the word uh, library of trajectories of behaviors offline. So if you sort of even just try to say what am I closest to. And then I warm start my solver. So you tell your solver, use this, that the trajectory I've already solved for offline as my initial guess for my online. Then your solver can be close to a good solution already and just optimize that last little bit. So that's an important uh, piece of it. And warm starting in general is, is a huge idea. That's the other thing you should know is that when you're doing it online, um, you don't actually have to solve the, the hard trajectory optimization problem on every time step you tend to be able to solve, the very first time step is a doozy. You have to solve the whole trajectory optimization problem at least once, because you have no, like when you just, you wake up and you didn't have any previous solutions to start from, you have to do a long-term plan, I guess. But the very next problem you solve, especially if you solve it like one, one thousandth of a second later, the data didn't change very much. And people tend to just do one or two little uh, clicks of, a, of the optimizer, for instance, one or two steps of the optimizer. And that tends to be enough to keep up with the moving solution. So you, it puts you in a different optimization space where you're kind of tracking a slowly moving optimization problem rather than solving a completely new one that's hard on every time step. Your idea about the using the making a cost to go out of trajectory optimization, everything like that, we're going to talk about something like that. Um, in the policy search. And people talk about lots of, there's lots of different ways to mix and match the ideas. 
So I do think that's a good idea. Um, it's just the devil's in the details. Let me put this up as people are, are finishing up and, and uh, if anybody wants to disappear, I still want your feedback, but I'm happy to keep answering questions. I, as a more high level question, in terms of just like how humans move and walk and run and that kind of thing, do you think that our framework is designed, like we're constantly just running something similar to optimizations when we walk and run? Or is there some, is there more like a some sort of nominal solution that we come back to and we just kind of make edits to that? Like we've yeah, learned yeah. how to walk, like this is the joint angle, set of joint angles that I need. And then we deviate from that as we need to when we trip over something or something like that. So I, I've actually thought about this a lot and um, over the years, right? So uh, let me give you one funny story, right? So, so sure. we put cameras on the head of pigeons and we were studying how they fly through forests, okay? And I was like, we're gonna describe this in the language of optimal control, right? We're gonna talk about how close they come to the obstacles, their energy efficiency, you know, whatever. And teamed up with our experimentalist, our, the biologist, he's put cameras on their heads, all these good things, right? So flying them in motion capture. We made these PVC forests, okay? So the, the like fake forests that we could control and the birds would do these amazing darting maneuvers. We started looking at the data, trying to describe it with, with optimization. <laughs> And it, would, it defied all our, our attempts to describe it. And then finally we said, okay, what if you just put like poles on one side of the room and no poles on the other side of the room? And it turns out those darn pigeons still with 50% probability would fly right at the poles. And then when they got <laughs> close, they would do something magical with their, with, you know, and, and they would with 50% chance take the easy path. But it, it, they're just not optimal. They're like not even close to optimal. Like there's not a long-term strategy going on in the head of that pigeon, right? Um, any attempt to describe it that way was just doomed to failure. It was okay. much more about like react as necessary and, you know, have wings that don't break and, and have a lot of thrust vectoring capability and stuff like that. Huh. So that's one answer. So I don't think we're actually, I think optimization is a language for saying how to describe the solutions, but I don't think humans are optimal often. Satisficing is a standard thing to say is that you're, you're good enough, you know, but we're probably, if we're optimal, there's a bunch of things that people do that we wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't do. But okay, now there's another thing, which is would I think um, people are remarkable. They can do tasks that they've never seen before. There, there's evidence that they are able to do this kind of long-term planning. So uh, uh, Josh Tenenbaum gives this example, which I really like, he calls it, I, I think ABC pickup game. He puts like a bunch of objects in front of uh, his daughter on a table and uh, and says, okay, pick up one object with your right hand, pick up another object with your left hand. She ends up with like, I don't know, a jello box and a light bulb or something. He says, okay, now with those two objects, pick up the third object, right? And so she's like, has this, this, this sudden task of like picking up a shoe with a light bulb and a, you know, jello box in her hand, right? And mm -hmm. Clearly she's never done that before, <laughs> right? You can say pretty, Pretty good guess that she's never done that before. And it takes a little bit of finagling, but she's manages to like do it and she picks it up. She's like, oh, you know, here's a good way to do it. She solves the problem online, right? So it can't all be, you know, baked in as controllers. But I do think as we do things, the things that we do more often probably go from being planning to being more like policies and you can see that in a lot of state, like even you can see that in AlphaGo, right? AlphaGo has a nice way where it does, um, it's playing Go, right? And it's, it does rollouts with the Monte Carlo tree search. You could think of that as your trajectory optimization, your planning. And it's also train, using those rollouts to train a policy uh, and a value function. And as it gets better, it, the rollouts are doing less and it's kind of baking in, um, baking in more and more into the policy. And there's like a nice, sort of path from being a planning system to being a, a reacting system. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've got it, I, that feels right to me. You know, something like that feels right to me. How do you do that for like all the tasks we do in life? Um, <laughs> I don't have a great answer for that yet. I would mm -hmm. love, I, I'm thinking about it, but, uh, but, but that's a good question. So I, so I think we do both, um, okay. but never yeah. probably optimally. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Long answer, sorry. I have a question. Um, 
Does it make sense to do direct transcription in problems where u is the first derivative of x? You definitely can. In fact, that's a common thing to do when, um, so, so like a lot of times you want to penalize the derivative of u, right? And so, so you would tend to put u into your, the thing you would originally have called u, you want to put into your uh, state and then you put a, then you effectively have u dot as your control, which then it gives me roughly what you just said, I think. Is that right? Yeah, it just like, it kind of feels like it's the exact same information twice, sort of. Like, if you have like a motion planning problem where maybe you're parameterizing the displacements as your control, and then your state is just the integral of those displacements, it doesn't make sense to have both of those be decision variables when they're so highly correlated. If you can solve them away, if they really don't couple in any way, uh, kind of like the, sh I mean, that's kind of like the difference between shooting and trajectory up and direct transcription. Um, but I think it still can make sense. Like if you really want to have an additive cost on something that, I mean, an, an alternative might be to put a cost on ut plus one minus ut, for, for, for instance, on pairs. And trajectory optimization, that would actually be okay. Uh, but they, it breaks the additive cost structure. The, the trajectory optimization is less dependent on the additive cost structure in general than the dynamic programming recursions. So um, I think you could do either I don't think it's redundant. It depends exactly which, which problem you're thinking of, but it, there are certainly cases where it would not be redundant, that it, there wouldn't be a obviously better way to, for me to put costs on the derivative. Thanks. But if you write down, if you wanna you know, write down anything specific, I'm happy to look at it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there's another question that I have that I've been asking myself for a long time. And imagine you want to do a trajectory optimization. You either have the choice to use the full nonlinear model, and then you, you have to solve an NLP with all the drawbacks that it, it involves. But you can also linearize everything and have that as a QP. But I'm wondering what are you losing when you're doing that? I feel like you would lose a lot of expressivity in the model on which for on over which you would be planning um, but I'm not sure so uh. to some extent that is what's happening in SQP methods right to, and but they're just doing it iteratively right so you, so if you take your original problem and you do just the straight up naive quadratic approximation of the cost linear approximation of the constraints and you solve that you get a solution and then you can re-linearize and solve again. That is actually what's happening in the SQP methods. So uh, it is a reasonable, totally reasonable thing to do, but I think you tend to want to do it over and over again in order to get back to, to something good. AJ, were you gonna show us a video? I, I... Yeah, would you like me to? I got totally. a couple of them. Yeah, yeah. AJ also has, his project last year was uh, doing a backflip with a, humanoid and he said he's got a, a better video than that so just go yeah let me see if i got it um do you want me to start with i can start with the one that we did last year let's see this will work all right can you all see that yep okay so yeah i guess kind of like you were mentioning so this is what we did last year with trajectory optimization so in this case, we were working with a humanoid, and so we had a simplified model. And so this was our goal was to do a backflip, but there were a couple of little example toy examples that we worked out at first, and then we wanted to put it into our uh, full robotic simulation that does all of the physics and dynamics for us. But because over on the left is a MATLAB simulation where we were generating the trajectories, and on the right is in the full simulation, and so we were trying to backflip off of a box was our main objective, trying to do something similar to what. Atlas does with its backflip. Um, so that's roughly what we got for uh, 
the project because the landing was rough. We didn't really do a whole lot with landing other than try to time it such that it could attempt to. So more recently, let's see if I can. So just to be clear, that that was a you know a two person project from a on a pro, on a robot that they've been working on before. So yes, uh, yes, creating that from scratch would have been a ridiculous amount of work. Uh, yeah, no, 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 we did not build this simulator specifically for this class. <laughs> Although it would have been awesome. That would have been a lot more work. We did we did build it all throughout the course of the spring, but that, that was not all just for the class. And then. So this is more recent. This is, I think, from December, the postdoc in our lab. He added, uh, so we, we found out more about just the capabilities of the motors on this robot because this robot's still being designed. So it turned out we had a lot more power than we realized. So what we used for the project was a much more underpowered version. And so this was using the more accurate understanding of how much power we had um, that we could apply to our jump. And this was adding MPC for landing. And so I think this one is the fast one. Yeah, so that was it's slightly raised. And obviously, it puts its knees into its chest, which is a little bit problematic. But much cleaner landing and that jump. That so good. Now I have a third more recent one. So from a paper that Matt did in January. Let's, here it is. He's got a couple more results because so he kept working on this and he he does all the trajectory optimization stuff for uh, a lot of the work we've done here. And so this was a paper that he made. So now this is we have an even better understanding of our motors and it turns out we have even more power. So this is using the full understanding of how much torque we can actually get out of this. So this is a front flip from ground with trajectory optimization and then landing with MPC. And then so good. we have the backflip. I think this one's also from ground. Yep. Landing with MPC. And so you can see the, the arms are getting involved because of uh, the controllers we have for balancing now built in as well. It's 180 spin as well. I think there's a fourth one. <laughs> Nice. And so, yeah, all of those are generated with trajectory optimizations very similar to what we talk about in class and talking in the text. Oh, there's a fifth one. Oh, yeah. And then other than this, we also have worked on doing a lot of how do we do these? So these were all generated offline. Oh, I guess there's even more. Um, so these were all generated offline. But something that we're trying to work on is how do we actually get this running online? So there was another paper from the fall that I couldn't find the videos for of the mini cheetah doing it online in hardware for jumps and uh, so basically jumping onto things that it could see in front of it, jumping to the side, jumping forwards, backwards, all kinds of different ways. And more recently, I guess you may have been alluded to a little bit from Charles's questions. Charles is actually working on uh, something pretty impressive for how we're trying to get walking and running using trajectory optimization. And so, yeah, how, how we warm start these to be able to run them fast enough online is kind of where we are now. Cool. Actually, on that note, I wanted to ask, um, so I know that for these trajectory optimizations, we have a fixed contact sequence for how long the foot is on the ground to push off. Is there a way we could formulate our optimizations to not require that constraint? Like a tractable. Oh man, you're you're asking exactly the right question. So uh, <laughs> that is also, that is a Seiwan is also a part of our lab group, so <laughs> he is okay. also helping us with this. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, it's harder, but we, yeah, we definitely, yeah. I can definitely have formulations that do it right. So you can, um, yes. So so we are going to talk about those two for sure. I mean the 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 short answer is you can do it in the sort of. Uh, direct transcription approach where you put in contact forces as complementary constraints and mm -hmm. uh, and just add extra constraints, add forces as a decision variable. Mm -hmm. uh, the other approach would be to do kind of a shooting based approach and soften the contact, but you have a stiff differential equation there. So the numerics are, are harder, but I think uh, like Emo Todorov and his, um, uh, his colleagues have made that work incredibly well, like very, very well. Yeah. So, because yeah, the discussion about the augmented Lagrangian cost function, I was wondering like if we could just have it so 
for as long as possible, keep your foot on the ground and push as much as you can um, and just penalize away from that. I feel like, I don't know, because yeah, my biggest discomfort with watching those trick conversations, it doesn't feel completely natural yet. Because when it jumps off, it's still, it's still kind of crouched up with his legs. And I feel like it could push off so much more. But just trying to estimate exactly what that number is, I feel like is, or how long it should stay on the ground, I feel like it's too, a little brittle. But yeah, I mean, that's, I'm sure it's an open research question, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you're right. So, so okay, if it's really just the time, I mean, so, so, um, if you allow time to be a decision variable, if you have the sequence pinned, but you just don't know how long it should stay on the ground before it pushes off, that one should fit in even with a fixed mode sequence, right? Mm -hmm. It's really when you're trying to make contact in an order that you don't know, you didn't anticipate that things get a lot harder. Right. We've actually, yeah, we've, we've been continuing to work on that and made some, uh, some progress I'm very excited about. Um, in, in I think the way to formulate that, uh, the more global search for that when you need to do that global search, but uh, that it is a, it's, it becomes more of a combinatorial problem. Uh, you really have to say either I'm I'm making contact or I'm not, and I have kind of different dynamics when I am or when I'm not. Right. It's a it's a classic non. I mean it's it's a it's like a disjunctive constraint because you're you're the the manifold of solutions in force and and velocity. Let's say. Uh, or you know, look like this uh, this discontinuous set. So it's it's a it's a hard one, but it's one yeah. we've, we've thought a lot about. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question. Yeah. So like, let's say I wanted to uh, learn a a way, I guess, just find a controller that will make my robot jump as high as it can. Mm -hmm. um, I'm my feeling is that the simulation. Our simulations may, I, I mean, I guess the question is like, are our simulations good enough that you can get a controller there and just apply it to the robot? You might want to work on landing first, but it depends. <laughs> but but uh, that was where we were with Atlas was that we, we had an awesome jumping animation, but to, to make it, uh, to run it on the real robot, we needed, I could, I, we actually did it one day. There was, so there was a day where they said, um, we're going to do upgrades to your robot. We're going to pick up the robot Thursday morning at like 10 a.m. and and completely replace the arms and and some whatever. So on Wednesday night, we're like, this is our chance. Even if we break the robot, it's getting upgraded tomorrow. So we we were like jumping off boxes and all this stuff. But I don't think we ever stuck the landing. We had like one night to try it. Uh, yeah. So I I think you're right that the devil's in the detail of the, that's your as soon as you hit the limits of your act your like actuator limits that's where the model needs to be pretty accurate, right? So, um, you know, if your actuator model is not high fidelity, then the type of motion you take, even in the, in the estimated height that you'd get for uh, something like that, where you're actually almost by definition at the limits of your performance, it just puts a bigger demand on the accuracy of your model. Where if you're somehow in the comfort zone, then even if your model parameters are a little wrong, you know uh, your actuator model might not be perfect. Then you could still execute that with a feedback controller on the real system. Uh, but it tends to just—it's totally possible, but it just—it's just a higher requirement on the model. Are you also working with Songbit? <laughs> I'm. I'm not. No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> There are a lot of us here, but not everybody is. <laughs> I think, so you guys do have a fairly good, I mean, like you, as you said, you got more and more accurate uh, actuator models in order to make this series of videos, right? Yeah, we have a couple of uh, students who their primary focus is on that. And like, we have one in particular who was on that paper that that was a big part of the paper was just the modeling of the actuator, how accurately we can you know, model, model, what, what are we going to actually get out of it? And the other thing we were concerned about is since we're doing all battery, there, our model, our battery model has been pretty weak. So in terms yeah. of getting max, what, like where, where are our, ba our motors going to fail? We've kind of just considered unlimited voltage up to this point, but we, we're increasingly improving our actuator model for that exact reason that we need high fidelity in the worst case. 
Yeah, and and I think you, you, you're going to get to a point. I mean, where if you're really trying to ride the limits there, you're going to get to the point where it's like the friction in the actuator is going to, you know, it's going to be really complicated actuator dy dynamics that's going to right. start playing. I, I the you know the animal paper that was talking about it, the focus was on RL, I guess, but uh, I think the using deep learning models for the actuator dynamics seemed to be a very reasonable idea in that case. Uh, and the, you know, I think they were able to achieve, achieve pretty, pretty high fidelity models in that case. Right. Awesome. You're welcome, George. Thanks, Eli.